You probably noticed that all four candles are now lit on the Advent wreath. That means we're just a few days away from celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus. And as we do so, we're continuing in this follow series. Our focus today is on community. I hope that you were with us last weekend, either in person or uh, online, and we had this great opportunity to respond with our commitments and follow, and we got all kinds of those cards turned in, and it was so great to see people coming forward or filling it out online and then praying about what God is going to do through those commitments as we've all been praying together. Jesus, lead me to listen to your voice and follow you. If you weren't able to do that last weekend, not a problem at all. You're invited to do that uh, today. You can fill it out online. Just follow the link in the chat. You can send in one of those commitment cards to our church office as well at 7380 Afton Road. At this time, kids, it's time for you to head off to Kids Link, a special teaching just for you. Excited for you to hear about God in a way that really makes a difference in your life. Uh, Moms and dads, your kids are heading out there. Just a reminder, you can grab our scripture card uh, anytime online at info.woodburylutheran.org. And that's a way that you can take the message for today a a little bit deeper throughout the week. Just sit in the word of God, uh, grow in your friendship with Jesus so that your love uh, for him and others will also grow. Uh, Our text today, our reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. In my Bible, this section is titled, The Believers Form a Community. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in the homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Father, move us into real and authentic community with other followers of Jesus. Amen. Uh, Let's pray. Uh, Father, thanks for this time together. Grateful that we can gather uh, to share our our praises of you, to be fed by your word. And so we pray that your spirit would be drawing us closer and closer to you and into real and authentic community that you'd be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, glad that you're back with us today as we continue in this follow series. I think this is week six now. And the whole uh, idea behind it is we're praying this prayer, Jesus Uh, We want to listen to your voice, and we want to follow you. So all the distractions uh, around us can drown out the voice of Jesus, and yet he's constantly inviting us to come and listen to him. And the whole idea is is all of us are invited. Everyone's invited to follow Jesus. So we've been looking at a few different things that we've been invited to along the way, and today uh, we're learning that we're all invited into community, which is really important in this day in age. Uh, back in 2007, this book was released called Unchristian. It was written by a Christian researcher named David Kinneman, who's now the president of Barna Research, along with Gabe Lyons. And Unchristian uh, looked at how millennials view Christians and the Christian church. And so they got all kinds of data from, you know, thousands of millennials, their experience with Christians in the church. And when they put it all together in this book, uh, the, the, what they found wasn't very encouraging. In fact, what they found is that most in the millennial generation looked at Christians in the church and they said, these are the things that mark them. Uh, they're hypocritical and they're anti-gay. Uh, they're sheltered from the world around them. They're far too political And they're judgmental. I remember reading this book when it came out in 2007 and thinking to myself, wow. And and even getting a little defensive about what was being said about me and the church. Uh, But here's the reality. Whether or not these are true or not, that is the perception. At least it was in 2007. And the reality is, I, I don't think it's gotten any better since then. 
Let me share a few uh, statistics with you now. Uh, Back in 2007, 16% of people in America identified themselves as nuns. And I'm not talking about nuns like the Catholic nuns, but nuns, N-O-N-E. No religious affiliation at all. So 16% of Americans in 2007. In 2021, just last Tuesday, Pew Research came out with their their study on this, and they found that today 33% of Americans identify themselves as no religious affiliation at all. It has more than doubled in the last 14 years. In that same period, in 2007, 78% of Americans identified themselves as Christians. Eight out of ten. Today, that number is 63%, or six out of ten. And it dropped two percent just from last year. However you cut these numbers, however you look at them, one thing is certain. That there is a a huge shift in faith that is happening in our culture. And it can't be ignored. And the same time that that this is going on, there's something else happening within our culture. And that's a, a new pandemic. And I'm not talking about COVID, but I'm talking about the pandemic of loneliness and isolation. A Barna Research just recently came out with some numbers that said more than 31% of adults in the United States of America are dealing with loneliness in a significant way that is impacting their lives. One third of people. Now there's all kinds of reasons why loneliness is more pervasive in our culture today than it's ever been before, but it's hard to ignore these numbers and not think that they have something to do with this new pandemic of loneliness in our culture, it's almost like we, we traded one set of problems in institutional religion for another set of problems over here in loneliness. Uh, in her book, The Loneliness uh, Epidemic, Susan Metz says this, Loneliness is the distress someone feels when their social connections don't meet their need for emotional intimacy. Loneliness is a thirst that drives us to seek companionship, or perhaps better, fellowship, which is real, meaningful relationships done in life, without fellowship, we go on needing others. That last line really grabbed my attention. Without fellowship, we go on needing others. And so whether you consider yourself to be an introvert or an extrovert, the truth is all of us need real community, true fellowship, where we can walk through life together. And so, I ask you, do you see the opportunity that we as followers of Jesus have to be the church? We can look at those numbers and get frustrated by them, get angry by them. We can say it's, it's simply the result of living in a post-Christian culture which we live in today. Or we can stop and we can take a look in the mirror, a good long look in the mirror and say, are those numbers maybe the result that we as the church have been getting how we live as the church wrong for a long, long time? Do you see the opportunity that we have to be the church, to live as the church, to once again invite people into real and authentic community where life change happens. That's a big, hairy, audacious goal in the culture in which we are living today. But we have the Holy Spirit on our side, and the Holy Spirit's been working in me, asking me, well, how how do we do this? Like, how how do we take this opportunity in in a culture that's moving away from Jesus and bring it back closer to Jesus? How, How do we do that? Well, a good place to start is looking back at the church in Acts, the early, early church. And one of the things that we have to understand is that in the early church, they held a far different place in their culture than we hold in our culture here in the United States of America. In that culture, they started out as a fringe cult. And Rome really wasn't even paying attention to them until they started to grow. 
And as the church started to grow and grow and grow, soon it became illegal to be a follower of Jesus in the Roman Empire. And for almost 300 years, it was illegal. It was a crime. And the punishment and the, the type of, of, of stuff they had to deal with along the way, the persecution is far beyond what we could even begin to imagine in our lives today. There was no talk of being elected to an office to make a difference there. Uh, There was no way that they were going to be setting policy. It wasn't even on their radar. Instead, they were focused on how do we live in community as followers of Jesus in a culture where we have no say, where we are not on the high ground, where we are not influencers by any of those other ways. And so they had to figure out a different way to influence the culture. And I got to tell you that no matter what was done to them, to get this little group, this little movement to stop growing, none of it worked. None of it worked. And that's because at the heart of what they were doing was attractive to the culture around them. Because it was so counter-cultural. And so as, as the people outside of the faith looked at these Jesus followers, they saw something different. They saw a group of people who were willing to sacrifice for one another in incredible ways. And not just for each other, but also for those who weren't even in their little fellowship, in their community. And they saw this group of people bring dignity to folks who had no dignity before. To women. Women had no standing in that culture, and yet they they showed them to be important. These were the the same people that were going to the garbage dump in Rome, and they they were grabbing children that were discarded because they were born as the wrong sex, and they were bringing them value. And the culture was saying, kids don't have value. Why are you doing that? And it was countercultural. And they cared for for widows. And orphans, people who would be pushed to the fringe of society and they cared for the sick. Why do you think almost every hospital is named like St. Mary's or St. John's or St. Joe's? It's because followers of Jesus were the first ones to take time to care for the sick. And the people in the culture saw that and they didn't know much about Jesus, but they're like, man, it would be kind of cool to hang out With those people, it was attractive. And it was attractive because they were focused on what matters. They were focused on listening to Jesus and following him. They were focused on keeping the main things the main things. And they weren't distracted by all the other things going on in culture. And they weren't worried And afraid, even though they were being put to death, fed to lions, hung on crosses, burned at the stake. They were focused on following Jesus, listening to his voice. And as we look at Acts 2, 42, we see some incredible ways of how they were being focused. And so here here we go. The believers form a community. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A couple things I want to point out there. First of all, notice it was all the believers. There was incredible unity in the church. Now, it didn't mean they didn't have problems, and we see that through the book of Acts, and as they're growing and trying to figure it out, and sinners are sinners, and the church is made up of of sinners. Our community is made up of sinners. It was the same thing for them, but they were all focused on being devoted. Think about what you're devoted to. I I was really taking some time and reflecting on this, and this is hard to say, but there are many times where when I look at my life, I, I would say I'm more devoted to my phone than I am to Jesus. And just to say that makes me feel pretty terrible, okay? But think about what are, you, what are you devoted to? That means to be faithful to. The early church, all the believers, they devoted themselves to four pillars. The first pillar was to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. 
They said, these, these are the four foundational things we're going to focus on. And you need all four of them there to be working in a healthy community. And so you have the apostles teaching, and, and we have the apostles teaching as laid out in the Bible today. And far too many churches today have taken the apostles' teaching, they've taken the teachings of Jesus, and they sort of set them to the side, and they're peripheral. But to the early church, they were the most important thing. They were focused on, and they were devoted to studying, and learning, and teaching, and preaching the apostles' teaching. Because that's where the foundation comes from. That keeps us focused where we need to be focused. And so they devoted themselves to that. Secondly, and a little surprisingly, they devoted themselves to fellowship, to doing life together. Not always easy, but so, so important. And especially in our culture where we value individualism so highly, and that's not all bad, but it brings with it some challenges. And one of them is, is this idea that we don't need anybody else. We need one another. You can't do following Jesus by yourself. You need to do it in community. And you say, yeah, but the church is full of hypocrites and you're judgmental and, and you're right, we're broken, we're, we're sinful, but we need to walk with each other. Third, they devoted themselves to the breaking of, of bread. And it's that same word that's used throughout the New Testament to talk about a regular meal and the Lord's Supper. And here the context says, this is the Lord's Supper. And on a higher level, whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're planting a flag in saying, we are declaring that our foundation is built on the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So don't stop declaring that. Don't forget what our foundation is on. It's the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And finally, what, what holds it all together is prayer. This incredible reminder that we've been invited into a relationship with the creator of the universe. That our God is not some far off disconnected deity, but he's a personal God who knows the number of hairs on our heads and invites us to walk with him in relationship. And there's no greater way to grow in that relationship than by talking and listening. And we're invited to do that in prayer. And so we see these four things going on in the early church. And as they were devoted to those four things, incredible fruit began to grow in their lives. And it was this fruit then that was noticed by those in the world around them. And so here's, here's what we see happening. You see that first line, there's this deep sense of awe that came over them over all the things that God was doing. And then we, we, read, we read this, that all the believers met together in one place. Here we go again, all of them. And they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. This is radical transformation happening within this community. And it is so, so attractional. Now, some of you, when I read these verses, maybe that lean a little more to the left, you're saying, there it is, it's... It's socialism. That's how we should be, be, be living. Or those of you on the right, you're saying, I'm a little uncomfortable with all, all of that. You know, I have my stuff and it's, it's mine. But this is not communism. This is not socialism. This is the people of God living together as family. And in order to understand that, we have to, to grasp the power of family in the ancient culture. In this world, so often entire families, extended families, not only would, would live together, but they would work together. And so you would have cousins working together and aunts and uncles, and it would be generational. And when they would make a sale from, from their crops or doing their blacksmith work or whatever it was, it wouldn't be just theirs. It would be all of theirs. They would share it. It would be for one another. We see this in the life of the disciples as they live together as a family, they share with one another. And so the early church is saying, that's what we are. We're, we're a family. We've been baptized into the name of Jesus. We follow Jesus. We have fellowship with one another. We share meals together, the Lord's Supper. We worship together. We're, we're a family. 
And so we're going to sacrifice for each other. And when it's just a small group of people, it's kind of easy to figure that out. But it gets challenging when there's lots and lots of people. And in the verse uh, before the first verse I read today, uh, we, we read that thousands were added to their number. And so they, they don't, they're not saying this is how you have to do it in every time and every space. But they're saying this is how we're going to do it here. And we're going to try our hardest to live as family. And they do that by sharing everything they had. And they do that by selling their property and possessions and, and giving to the money to those in need. It's easy to, to gloss over those words and say, that's kind of cute. There's incredible sacrifice here. Uh, you got to understand how land worked at that time. Uh, lots of land would be in a family for generations and generations, maybe all the way back to the promise of God that I'm going to give you this, this land as your own. And to, to sell a piece of land was radical. And then to do it, not for your own benefit, for the benefit of somebody else, was, was mind-blowing. And so just imagine you're, you're someone who's buying a piece of property from one of these followers of Jesus, and you're like, why are you selling the property? And they say, oh, you know, Lisa down the street, she's a single mom now, and she's got a bunch of kids, and, you know, she can't buy food, and so we're going to use some of that money to help her uh, buy, buy food. It's a radical concept, and it's attractive, and it led those on the outside to go, I don't know everything about this Jesus and, and all this other stuff you're doing, but... Is there room for me in your community? Because it seems incredible. And it didn't stop there. They were getting together at the temple each day. They were meeting in homes, again, for, for meals with each other. And they were doing it with, with great joy and generosity. And all, all the while, they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all, all, all the people and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Of course they were praising God. And of course he was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Because this is how it works when the church is living together in authentic community. Focused on what we're supposed to be focused on. Incredible things were happening in this community and in the world around them because at the center of it was something called agape love. Uh, in the New Testament, there's a bunch of different words that are, are translated into English as, as love. But each of these words in Greek have a different focus. For example, phileo. It's where we get Philadelphia and it means brotherly love. It's, it's how we love one another. It's It's friendship. And then there's eros love, which is that, that love you get when you, you hold your significant other's hand for the very first time and that feeling comes over you. And then there's agape love. And agape love is a sacrificial love. It's a love that says, I'm going to do this for you without expecting anything in return. And it's this kind of love that we have received in Jesus. Paul writes about it in Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, but God, but God gave us his son so that we could be alive in Christ. And in just a few days from now, we're going to kneel down at the manger and we're going to worship our king, our God, who's shown up in the flesh to show us exactly what agape love looks like. And when agape love is at the center of our community, our fellowship, not only does it bring incredible joy to us, even though there's sacrifice involved, but it is attractive to the world around us. And they stop saying all the negatives about us, and they start wanting to be a part of who we are. One of my favorite authors and theologians, an Anglican guy named N.T. Wright, he says this, there is an attractiveness and energy about life a life in which we stop clinging to everything we can get and start sharing it, giving it away, celebrating God's generosity by being generous. And that attractiveness is one of the things that draws other people in. 
our culture is changing. Fewer people are identifying with any religion, much less as being followers of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus seems like it's becoming more and more challenging in our culture. And there could very well come a day in my time where I I could be thrown in prison for preaching the truth about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. We might have to face persecution. And there could be incredible challenges that are in front of us as the church. And it might not look the same as it does today in 20 years from now. And we can complain about that or we can be scared about it. Or we can you know, get angry about it, or we can do something about it. Do you see the opportunity that we have to be the church of Jesus Christ today? The opportunity that we have to follow, to listen to Jesus and to go where he calls us. Because here's what I know. The gospel of Jesus Christ has not changed from Acts 2. His power has not diminished. Jesus is not like one of those little wind-up toys that you wind up and you, you go and as it goes further, it loses its power. That's not how it works with Jesus. And I know that there are still people out there who need to be rescued. And at Woodbury Lutheran Church, we are going to be a people who listen to and who follow Jesus and we're going to do it in community. And we're going to be a a people who are focused on the main thing. And that's the apostles' teachings. That's fellowship, real authentic fellowship where we can be real with one another. We don't have to be fake about our challenges and struggles. We're going to be a a people who, who plants our flag in the resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. And every time we have Holy Communion, we are going to celebrate and remember his death and his resurrection. And we're going to be a people who pray. And the result of that is we're going to be attractive. We're going to be attractive not because we're better than everyone else, not because we have it all together, but because the Holy Spirit is authentically working through us. And we're going to be a people who are filled with agape love for one another. And as we do, the world's going to look at us and they're going to say, Woodbury Lutheran Church You all are crazy in the way that you're generous toward each other, the way that you're kind, the way that you love, even those outside of your fellowship. And we're not so sure about Jesus. But do you have any room for us in your community? And we're going to say, everyone's invited to be in community. And now it's my joy to share with you an incredible testimony, testimony of two people in our community. Dave and Heidi Hove, they sit right here in my heart. And they're going to talk to you about the transforming power of community and how it manifests itself in, in being just generous. And they're going to be way too shy in the way they talk about how generous they are. But these are two of the most generous people that I've ever met. And it starts from a place of agape love. The love they've received from Jesus that they now show and share with those around them and even those that they have never met. And So let's take a minute now and watch this. A lot of people probably are not aware that uh, it is a second marriage for both Dave and I. And we went through some incredibly hard, challenging, difficult times. Anxiety and tension of a blended family. Um, We knew it was going to be difficult, but it was probably tenfold, uh, more than what we had anticipated. So you take that and you mix in a broken world and a little bit of sin, and uh, you got a recipe for a tough time. Social media makes life seem like it's perfect and wonderful and all the highlights of your life. A lot of times that's what people see of you because that's what you project. Um, But behind the scenes or underneath the waterline, 
There's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, and we had a number of very difficult, challenging years related to that and were incredibly hurt and broken. Um, and I think for both of us, probably to the point where we had nothing left. We had nothing left to give. We had nothing left, you know, in our relationship, in our marriage, in our families. And it was the church that held us together. It was the pastors um, that circled around us. It was our church family. You know, we were actually going through divorce proceedings. I mean, we had been through a couple of mediations. We were a couple of signatures away from being divorced. It's an absolute miracle that we're together. We hear a lot of people say, you know, that we're generous. Um, not nearly as generous as we feel God has been with us. Um, I think a lot of that generosity comes from just being so incredibly grateful for what we've been through and where we are right now. You know, we feel like how can we not have that as our response um, from the things that we've been through? Through it all, through the journey, we've just been incredibly blessed. And Lord has been so faithful to us. And sometimes you kind of ask, why? I mean, we're so grateful. Um, and that's what fuels our generosity. And you we've know, been blessed in certain ways to get involved with certain organizations that you see tangible evidence of helping people in so many ways. And that's, that's what it's all about, right? The joy comes from, I feel like having been redeemed, having been brought out of the trial, you know. Um, so every day is like, I am grateful and find joy in that and joy in wanting to share that feeling, wanting to help spread that in um, other people, other communities. There's so much brokenness and division to, that's going on that people need to hear about God. They need to hear the gospel. They need to know that through all the brokenness in the world, that there is joy, there is something to come out of the earthly challenges. They may not see it in the way that we have now, but there is. Follow Christ is to just not look to yourself for, for where you're going. Um, just focus, focus your mind on the Word, focus your mind on Christ, um, and see where He leads you. Like, He's been very faithful to us, um, so just keep following. All the things going on in the world today, you can get depressed, angry, disheartened by a lot of that, but we tell each other, Focus on the kingdom. Focus on the kingdom. Follow Jesus. Follow, you know, what his message would be, what his words would be, and focus on that. You do that, you're not going to go wrong. <laughs> Jesus, lead me to listen to your voice and follow you. What an incredible story of the power of community uh, at work in the life of uh, Dave and Heidi. 
And I want you to know that wherever you're at today, uh, there's a place for you in the community of Woodbury Lutheran Church. Uh, You don't have to walk through life alone. You don't have to be isolated. That shows itself in different ways and getting connected in different ways. Uh, But there's a place for you. And the body of Christ here at Woodbury Lutheran will be better uh, for that. So I want to take a moment and just pray uh, over everything that we've heard in the service and received from the Lord. Uh, Father, we thank you that you have invited us to be in your family, uh, that you have adopted us into your family through the gift of faith uh, given to us by your Holy Spirit. We give you all thanks and honor and praise this day uh, that you have invited us to experience authentic and real community Uh, That not only takes us out of the grip of loneliness, but it brings us life as it takes us up from the grave and raises us to life, even as Jesus is alive. And now may we live that life for your glory, for your honor, that the world around us would see us. And like the early church in Acts 2, that we would have favor from all the people. That we wouldn't be known for those things that we're against or our failures. But overwhelmingly, we'd be known for the agape love that we've received in you and now get to share with the world around us. May we do that in a way that honors you and brings you all glory and praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being in worship with us today. I know that you've been blessed by the work of the Spirit. Uh, Now take that with you back out into your life. Hoping that you have a great Christmas and that we'll see you either online or in person, all kinds of opportunities. And remember, on the 26th, we are online only and we'll be back in person and online the weekend of January 2nd. May God be with you over these next few days and may you just be moved as you experience the agape love of Jesus as he comes to you as a little child. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.